Okay, Bharat Bhai is here. We'll start. So good afternoon uh, to our esteemed uh, investors and partners. Uh, my name is Nimesh Mehta and on behalf of ASK Investment Managers family, I welcome you all again on the eighth quarterly webinar with Mr. Bharat Shah, Executive Director at ASK Group. Like every quarter, we have scheduled approximately one and a half hour time for this webinar, where Bharat Bhai will share his initial comments on macros, markets and portfolios in the first half. And then in the second half, he will try and answer all your questions. So I request all of you to keep typing your questions in the chat box. As a moderator, I'll curate and ask Bharat Bhai on your behalf. Today's webinar uh, will split into three parts. Uh, and Bharat Bhai, I'll begin with the question which we've been getting over the last uh, five, seven days. Uh, and the questions from the investor has been, uh, there's a situation of a third world war kind of a situation where the geopolitical risk seems to be just increasing day by day. Uh, in the last month, uh, we have seen US Fed cut rates of uh, after four years of 50 basis point. Uh, and there was expectation that there will be a flood of money coming into India, which it, but over the last few days, money has just pulled out from India and moved towards China. And there has been a continuous fall of, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say continuous fall, but uh, Indian markets haven't seen some falls for a longer period of time. The recoup has been very faster. So a little bit of uh, nervousness of the clients have been there. That what's happening, how do we read, uh, and none better than you with 33, 34 years of experience uh, of seeing markets, I mean, in the markets, maybe knowing markets for long enough there to guide us that how do you read this kind of developments and how uh, should investor approach uh, the situation? Over to you, Bharat Bhai. Uh, with all the market experience, I'm still not uh, Nostradamus. And I have no ability, uh, no capability to make predictions about World War Three or skirmishes or fights and wars which are going on. But for whatever it is worth, my two bit of opinion on that particular matter, uh, purely as an individual, because no such opinions have any meaning, uh, except uh, the opinion holder may have uh, some value for that opinion. So all of you have to take it with a pinch of salt, whatever I have to say, but I, I can, the world is far more noisy a place, isn't I? Uh, that it is uh, getting more and more driven by immediacy and uh, follies of near-term kind, maybe noise drummed up by social media kind of mentality. Uh, that is certainly true. But if you think about it, uh, in February 22, Russia and Ukraine uh, war occurred, which is still going on two and a half years, and it is not over. <clears throat> and if you uh, revisit initial reactions of various Chatterati and commentariat and others on uh, that skirmish, uh, which is still, <clears throat> or rather a war, which is going on, Initially, people thought it will get over in a few days' time. Russia will uh, kind of overrun Ukraine in no time. Uh, then it is it moved ahead uh, with the involvement of the Western world. Uh, opinions were that this is a potential to get into third world, uh, third world war uh, situation. Two and a half years have gone by. And we've seen no signs of anything of that kind. Therefore, even purely as a student of uh, uh, these issues. So once again, I'm saying uh, I'm not a Nostradamus and my opinion you have to take with a huge, huge pinch of salt. But going by the context, going by the history, going by 
the way the two uh, adversaries are placed in these theater of war, uh, I'm talking more of Israel and uh, Iran situation. To me, it looks unlikely and with a limited, very low probability that a third world war kind of situation can come up. Because if you can see there is on on uh, one of the one of the contestants in the theater of war, uh, significant part of the uh, significant part of the global support is being uh, in a very pronounced manner uh, announced. And on the other side, you can see a kind of isolation. Therefore, purely as a student of uh, an observer of these situations, I would not, I would put a very low probability that anything of this kind uh, is in offing. Even Iran itself uh, yeah, made it a point to say that they are doing a boundary here and they don't want it to be escalated. So I I would not assume such a scenario. Whether the conflict can get more intense is a possibility. Uh, that cannot be ruled out. Uh, whether it will result into uh, potential greater tensions, mainly on uh, on uh, really the part concerning uh, oil and all of that is a is a significantly high possibility. But all of these, uh, at the end of the day, are you know kind of a short period issues and short period challenges. So I don't see this uh, in a context much larger than that. So that's my personal opinion uh, for whatever it is uh, worth. Secondly, as far as China and um, the sudden upsurge in the Chinese markets is concerned, we must remember uh, that probably China has bought some time for its struggling economy and it's moribund or virtually dead kind of stock markets. Uh, with the stimulus injected, that is what probably they have achieved. They have bought some time for themselves. But structurally, China remains in a very, very difficult situation as much as I understand of whatever data I've gathered and I've observed over a period of time. China remains in a deep structural malaise and a lot of challenges. Therefore, stimulus and injection of the money uh, is at best a palliative and is not a cure uh, for the malady. And this is not the first time uh, that China has done this. Uh, over the last two decades, uh, this has happened five times by China. Uh, this is the fifth instance when China, China had to do this, what it is done. But if you look at prior to the stimulus, uh, after which markets have jumped up, uh, if you see Chinese markets have produced a negative return even over 15 year period. 15 year is not a short period by any stretch of imagination. On a 30-year basis, China has made meaningless 1% uh, kind of a return in the stock markets. While their economy has grown multifold several times over, the uh, economy in 30 years has grown at 13.5% in dollar nominal terms. But markets have been virtually moribund and almost comatose, that even in 30 years, Chinese markets have produced uh, just about 1% or even less than that kind of a return. That indicates that there are deep structural issues and these are not technical problems. And structural deep troubles and issues can't be solved by 
uh, injecting some money. If it were to be that simple, it, uh, then it would have been done uh, much, much before uh, by China and uh, wouldn't have allowed things to come to this pass. So my personal opinion, based on looking at Chinese situation, where there are three, four large trouble spots. A, uh, the economy is 40% of the GDP of China is real estate. Second, real estate has been in a state of deep freeze and fall uh, for a long period of time. And therefore, it is leading to whatever, you know, uh, whatever are outstanding uh, loans against uh, houses, many of them are defaulting simply because the uh, remain, value of the asset is lower than the uh, balance amount of the loan payable. Uh, this problem is very real. There is no real demand uh, for the new housing. And you must remember there are seven crore unoccupied houses in inventory in China today. That means almost about 25, 30 crore people can stay. That much of spare capacity of housing is available. Therefore, Chinese real estate is unlikely to go in hurry in, uh, in, uh, to rise. And therefore, when an economy is some 40% in real estate uh, and which is falling and where there is no new demand, uh, you can understand uh, structurally it's a huge, huge issue. Second, China is a hugely leveraged economy internally. For an economy of $18 trillion, internal borrowings are in excess of $50 trillion. So it is hugely leveraged economy within even though it is a significant economic surplus uh, in external side with exports much higher than the imports for China. Third issue that China structurally has is a very low level of consumption compared to virtually any country, whether you take any Western world country uh, like uh, US or uh, Europe, or uh, even countries in Asia, or country like India, unlike any of these countries, Chinese GDP consumption is less than 40% of GDP. For India, that number is more like 57-58% uh, is the individual uh, private consumption, and you add government consumption, uh, then it uh, almost is two-thirds of economy. Compared to that, China is only less than 40% in consumption. In America, it is almost 75%. Therefore, economy which is too much reliant on other than consumption, which is by injecting more investment or by making more commitment there, uh, is a harder and harder game for them to do. Because consumption is replicable. Other things have to constantly have to inject in order to grow. And therefore, China is a deeper trouble. And because uh, real estate is uh, not doing well, because stock markets have not been doing well, um, Chinese savings are channelized into unproductive investments, which are basically lined with the banks and not really converted into productive assets, uh, earning low rate of return because uh, Chinese householders don't have enough confidence about stock markets. They don't have enough confidence. Well, by, by chance, mute. you got muted by mistake. I don't know how. Let me try if I can. Yeah. Sorry. So Chinese, uh, uh, you know, where less than 40% of GDP is consumption and uh, much of the economic surpluses, savings of Chinese people are converted into less productive bank deposits and uh, money around rather than into productive channels. Uh, and their apathy for stock market and the 
uh, real estate uh, for the reasons that I stated. That makes the trouble very entrenched one and can't be so. Finally, uh, the China has a dilemma about spurring the economy by putting more money into investment because already there is an excess capacity virtually in all areas. Therefore, if they put more investments, whether in steel capacity or cement capacity or others, chemicals or what else, uh, they have more trouble on their hand. Also, their capital efficiency is very poor. Indian, or uh, compared to Indian capital efficiency, return on capital employed and return on equity, uh, Chinese capital efficiency is less than half. Therefore, they have to inject far more capital in order to get uh, equal output. And therefore, trying to stimulate economy by throwing more money into investment is unviable because of spare capacity, plus it is very unproductive output. Consumption is entrenched feature and savers don't want to consume because they are uncertain about the future. Uh, uh, and um, uh, the real estate is a kind of a millstone around uh, Chinese economy's neck. Given all of these issues, I do not, whatever I understand, uh, I'm not an expert, no expert on China, but whatever basic picture I've read and understood and observed over time, China's issues are not technical. These are deep, these are real, and they cannot be solved by these uh, short-term palliatives. Uh, problem of surgeries cannot be solved by putting Band-Aid. Band-Aid can only give you a kind of a illusion of a relief when what you need is a surgery. I suspect China's situation is something similar. People in the uh, social media world that we live in, everything is here and now, everything is instantaneous. So people want to make immediate judgment, immediate stuff. Therefore, the moment something like this happens, people want to jump in and want to, uh, it is a bit cowboyish uh, behavior actually, to take money out and uh, out of say, India or other places and put it into China. Be, just before the stimulus, uh, the foreign capital has virtually given up on Chinese markets. And they were the ones which inflated Chinese market to these uh, unsustainable uh, proportion. And then they made deep, deep losses over a long period of time. They had virtually given up and vacated Chinese markets by drove. Suddenly, with this one change, a lot of people have tried to jump in. Time will tell whether such uh, short-term game beats are successful. And anything which has gone up sharply, uh, I mean, comically, almost the kind of returns Chinese markets have earned over a 30-year period, uh, almost similar kind of returns have been earned with the stimulus. I mean, you can, uh, it sounds very ironic and uh, so to say comic actually. Therefore, I, I, I would prefer to just watch and observe. India is a structurally deep and long-term story, long-term opportunity of a character and strength India's uh, capital efficiency today is number one in the world. Last year, it displaced America from that, return on capital employed and return on equity. Growth rate of Indian economy is uh, not only at the highest uh, compared to anyone in the world, but it is uh, likely to be durable for a long period of time. Uh, and uh, it is more predictable because of the many deep and uh, significant reforms uh, that India has embarked upon over last 10 years. And finally, uh, <clears throat> many things have improved in the macro character of India. Uh, debt equity ratio of Indian corporates have halved in last five years. What it was in 2019 today is half of that, while India has grown enormously, even though two years were interrupted with COVID. Uh, capital efficiency I already referred to, where India has now become number one in the world, where America held that uh, title for decades. Uh, also, uh, 
banks are in a very, very strong position. Lenders are in a very strong position. Thanks to all the cleanup that began from 2019, 20, 21, and part of 22. Therefore, Indian lenders are in pink of health. Uh, safely, one can say the best lending sector in the world today in terms of the health. Also, Indian borrowers are in a very strong position. And with a high growth rate, now all signs are visible that private capital expenditure will begin in major earnestness. Capital formation, which was about 33.5%, is now inched up to 37% in India. So slowly but clearly, numbers are beginning to rise. Capacity utilization is touching closer to 80% for the economy, which is usually a level few percentages lower than that where new capex is to begin. And therefore, now all signs are there where India's growth will be not only superior, but durable, predictable, with a superior capital efficiency, backed by deep and structural reforms. Therefore, growth becomes endemic. <coughs> rather than a chance or a accidental happenstance. And therefore, uh, you see, Indian markets <coughs> that are so getting affected in last five, six sessions, for whatever it is worth, I do not have any much opinion on short-term behavior of market. But I think three observations I can make. One, uh, that uh, China factor, where some foreigners would have sought to move money from India to China. That's one. Secondly, mm, uh, these uh, war between Israel and fears of expanding uh, remit of the war uh, uh, kind of uh, really uh, gave a, a sharp uh, rap on the knuckles of Indian markets. Thirdly, markets had moved up nicely. And therefore, always a rising market looks for excuses to uh, kind of correct themselves. In my opinion, the, uh, also the fourth factor, if I have to put in, uh, the new uh, derivative rules, uh, which uh, very appropriately SEBI has uh, proposed, which are going to get implemented from November middle. But invariably, uh, a lot of in, uh, uh, you know, foreign institutions which get entangled in all of these and they are a significant player they hedge funds as well as many of the other players uh, I suspect uh, many of them would find that uh, free money that they were earning probably theft, and therefore a uh, lot of loosening of the purse by them also would have occurred because they won't wait till uh, November middle when actually it rolls out. So I think uh, that makes it actually healthy because tightening of this market with the rules on this derivative was much needed. It will make markets were already very well regulated and safe. But with these uh, derivative rules which are upcoming, I think markets will become even, Indian markets will become very, very robust in terms of the health. So these factors all have combined together to produce uh, uh, some kind of a reaction in the market. Beyond that, I don't read anything much. I continue to believe uh, that we are at a cusp of one of the greatest economic expansions as a country. Uh, that growth will reflect into the performance of the businesses, the top line, the bottom line, the cash flow. In turn, it will reflect into the value of those businesses. In turn, it will reflect into the wealth of the promoters and owners of these businesses. And finally, it will reflect into the portfolios of the uh, investors who hold basket of many of these uh, Indian businesses. And nothing on that has changed. A uh, uh, lot of time, people seem to have a lot of difficulty and trouble about Indian market valuation. Uh, if there are any questions, I can answer that. But I don't suffer from any undue level of concern on market valuations. Not that market valuation is any meaningful way to invest or any necessary guide to go by. But in general, if there is extremity of valuation, we all as individuals would be concerned. 
but I don't see any such extremity. So if there is any follow-up question on that, I'll be happy to answer, but I, I, I'm not deterred or unduly concerned about Indian market valuation. I think markets are in a right territory, fair territory. Uh, time to time, these skirmishes and troubles will come, which actually makes markets healthy. So there's just a little bit of interruption is how I view it. Great. Uh, there are a few questions, but uh, there's one more, uh, which I asked at the start, which what uh, clients want to know. Uh, last quarter when we spoke, we were uh, hoping that the Fed will cut rate. Fed did cut rate and it cut by almost 50 basis point. I don't know whether the street expected that or not. So the question uh, uh, clients have is that, is there any correlation between interest rates and equity markets? What is of your, course. yeah, and what is it that and how? Value of any asset uh, in the numerator is some measurement of profits and cash flow. And in the denominator is some measurement of cost of capital. And therefore, interest rate is an important component of the cost of capital. Ultimately, cost of capital for a business is cost of equity plus uh, cost of borrowing, so the cost of uh, uh, external uh, capital. So cost of internal capital and cost of external capital. Internal capital is more expensive because it is equity and expectation of the uh, return on that uh, will be higher in double digit. Cost of uh, external capital borrowing is tax adjustable, therefore it is cheaper, plus uh, the nominal rate also will be lower than the cost of equity. Therefore, cost of capital is reflected in the denominator and on the uh, in the numerator is some kind of measurement of profit and cash flow and therefore uh, it is simple mathematics uh, when there is uh, reduced cost of capital and not one time but durable part and where there is a confidence that the cost of capital is not accidentally come down but will remain at a lower level for a length of time uh, then obviously uh, valuation or other things being equal will rise, which is one of the reasons why consumer businesses, say for example in America, in Europe, uh, where uh, rate of growth of consumer business is uh, close to zero. You know? I mean, it is hardly half percent, one percent kind of growth rate, if at all. Yet many of those businesses are at valuation of 30 times and 35 times uh, on the price and the multiple. That is simply because the cost of capital is so low in uh, those parts. And therefore, uh, by inverse uh, uh, application, uh, the valuation automatically becomes high. So uh, without any doubt, any reduced cost of capital, which is durable for a long period of time, where there are logical reasons to believe that it will remain contained, like in India, there are legitimate reasons to believe because we have been very prudent about our fiscal deficit. We have been very prudent and wise about uh, during COVID not to inflate demand by throwing free money the way Western world has done, but by actually stimulating on the supply side, which India stood in a unique position where it inflated supply by giving incentive like PLI scheme for manufacturing for uh, supply side stimulation rather than demand side, which Western world did. And therefore, uh, Western world has been suffering for a long time on inflation and therefore high interest rates by their history. And therefore, they are forced to reduce. While India has been on a steadily reducing cost of capital. And I think uh, once we have crossed the hump on inflation uh, and with RBI's comfort level, uh, uh, I, I think uh, there are reasons to believe the cost of capital may reduce further in India. And cost of capital in India is at a real and healthy level. And net of inflation, they are still uh, a couple of percentage real interest rates, while in Western world, real interest rates are still closer to zero. So, uh, will it be fair to assume that quality and high-growing companies will have an advantage uh, in the phase when the uh, interest rates go down? Well, 
quality is always advantage. It is we who try to judge all the time that whether quality works now or quality doesn't work. There are times when enough of that voice results in a market behavior where for some time markets also behave like this, maybe for a year, maybe for two years. But quality always prevails. And quality is not just a philosophical statement because it is nice sounding. Quality makes growth secure. Quality makes growth durable. Quality makes growth more predictable. And quality ensures uh, ultimately measurement of value of a business is a simple economic idea called economic value added. Economic value added is nothing but a difference between uh, capital efficiency or the return on capital employed minus the cost of capital. Therefore, if the capital efficiency is uh, rising, the economic value added is rising because for the same cost of capital, if ROCs are rising, uh, the economic value added is higher and rising one. And therefore, value creation is enhanced. Uh, and quality fundamentally means rising capital efficiency, superior capital efficiency. In India's case, two interesting things are happening. Capital efficiency is rising, cost of capital is falling. And therefore, the twin effect is improving economic value added by both the metrics. Improving capital efficiency as well as reducing cost of capital. And this is it a route for improved valuation of the Indian markets. Uh, it is not some uh, uh, general benediction from God above that Indian markets are, um, uh, you know, showered with affection and valuations have gone up. First of all, valuations themselves have been more or less in the 10-year average territory. It is not as if they are high. Uh, Nifty is trading at roughly about 21 and a half, 22 times, similar to what it is traded on a 10-year average. Not very different, actually. But a lot of character has changed. Capital efficiency is risen. Cost of capital has come down. Uh, lenders are in a very healthy position. Borrowers in a sound balance sheet. And a country has acquired growth character because of the reforms. And therefore, growth is you know, durable and predictable. These conditions put together have resulted in confidence about markets and businesses and therefore the durability and prevalence. Perfect. Uh, we move to the second section of the call uh, after the macros. We'll jump into the quarterly results. And also I'll pick up question from Mr. Jaydeep Doctor, which says, by the way, your view is fine, but what are the sectors, industries one should invest into? What are you investing? At the same time, there's a question of uh, Mr. Bikram Chan. He's saying Mr. Uh, banking stocks have underperformed. But let me put it differently uh, and ask Bharat Bhai, uh, in, your in our portfolios, we've seen in the last one, one and a half years, the weightage of banking has gone slightly uh, uh, lower. Uh, in uh, The financials have gone lower, uh, moderately, a little more banking has gone lower. At the same time, we have seen a lot of increase or double the weighted into infra engineering manufacturing space. So would you like to uh, touch on both the questions and also your views on the sectors? So first, let me answer the question on sectors. Uh, our effort always is to buy modern mark. But that said, in a rising economy, many, many things get lifted up. And many things become attractive which wouldn't have sounded so at one uh, in some other context or in another uh, period of an economy. But in a rising economy, many things are doing well. Many new opportunities are opening up. Let me give some example and illustration. Uh, consumption is no longer consumption of staples of the uh, food or, uh, 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 you know, uh, shampoos and oil and whatnot. But it is more about premium consumption. Consumption of durables is occupying more and more share in the consumption basket rather than consumer staples. Therefore, consumer discretionary, consumer luxury. Luxury, for example, India, I would say, is the only large, real, big market for luxury products. And therefore, luxury businesses will do very well in India over a period of time. Therefore, 
it is not the traditional typical consumption of the staples that we have been accustomed to seeing over last century and the previous decades are the kind of businesses which are going to be high in growth. Uh, while that consumption of staples also will grow because the country is still on an expansionary move in all strata of society. But I think the rate of growth of discretionary consumption, premium consumption, luxury consumption, uh, consumption of durables, all of these will be much more distinguished. Uh, pharmaceutical reflects similar opportunity and similar uh, behavior. At one point of time, pharmaceuticals in India were copycat pharmaceuticals, which were basically violating uh, the patents and the rights, but do reverse engineering and sell copycat solutions where you don't pay any royalty or uh, uh, patent cost, but you just melt the market by your chemistry skills. From there, we became a patent a, a regime with patents uh, hold a value and that we can't violate. And therefore, every local player also needs to be compliant of global patents of any products. From there on, we have moved to a situation where Indian firms have begin, begin to invest into improved chemical entity uh, kind of solutions. And not just copy code solutions, but improved chemical entity where you do your research and improve the chemical molecules and find out new uh, opportunities there. Uh, therefore, uh, para four kind of findings and novel solutions on pharmaceutical came out. Now we have seen over the last few years, brand new, new chemical entities themselves are being discovered, not uh, improved chemical entity but new chemical entity where original uh, new pharmaceutical solutions from the likes of uh, Sun Pharma, uh, uh, from Dr. Reddy, uh, even Glenmark, uh, we have seen original solutions having emerged. All of these are showing maturation of the capability of the strain. Uh, India is a very strong local market in pharmaceutical where there is a long-term growth path available. And mounting the strength of that local market, India is easily the pharmacy of the world, where now with all the troubles in American market and European market, finally, uh, this regime of the pricing erosion in America and other places is settling down. And there is no other country which has capability to fulfill that opportunity like India has. So pharmaceutical, healthcare, medical devices, uh, 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 healthcare related services, all of these represent great opportunities. Lending itself uh, continues to remain an important opportunity, both on the, at a personal level, a, at business level, and uh, for infrastructure. Uh, uh, and balance sheets are healthy, as I mentioned, both of lenders and borrowers. And growth ensures that there is a more and more need for borrowing and lending in order to support the growth. Because there is a collinearity of the GDP growth with the lending business growth. Similarly, we are seeing mammoth lips being made in the infrastructure area. Whether we talk about ports, whether we talk about roads, whether we talk about uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, the uh, aviation, uh, railways, all of these are under glasnost kind of transformation phase. And therefore, a lot of new opportunities in infrastructure have opened up, which we have never seen before. Similarly, defense, railways are getting revolutionized. And under thanks to Akhanirbhar campaign, and deep focus on building in critical areas of our own core capability rather than being vulnerable and reliable on the external side is something which has been a, a, a clarion call in terms of uh, reorienting the thrust and the strength of the Indian economy. Uh, therefore, uh, all kinds of uh, various areas of manufacturing and industry are becoming a huge opportunity. When did you ever see, even two years back, it would have been impossible to conceive that semiconductor businesses can come up in India. But today it is uh, uh, going to be reality. 
the first output from micron facility will start coming out uh, before the end of the calendar year 2025. And it will be first India made uh, uh, semiconductor chips. I would say, even though it is an initial effort and it is not at the highest end of the technology, but it's a deep change and very vital, important change in the calendar. Similarly, on the mobile and EMS, electronic manufacturing services, where India has truly an opportunity to be at the forefront of the world. And we have seen, for example, in mobile phones, how uh, five years back, India was an importer of mobile phones to the extent of about uh, one lakh crore plus per annum. And last year, India exported 120,000 crore worth of mobile phones. Complete metamorphosis uh, 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 kind of a transformation uh, from North Pole to South Pole type. Uh, where uh, what you imported is the amount that you exported last year. So manufacturing various shades, new kind of manufacturing, new opportunities, all these are very important areas. Digitization, technology embrace are throwing up a lot of new opportunities, including in manufacturing, because manufacturing is no longer manufacturing of the past. It is co-bundled with technology and manufacturing is no longer the engineering of the past. It is chemical engineering, uh, mechanical engineering, electronic engineering, and all of that hardness with the digital power. Therefore, um, uh, uh, automation uh, in, in uh, factory floors, uh, kind of uh, methods of manufacturing, all are undergoing dramatic changes. It's nothing short of revolution. Therefore, capital goods and other businesses have a huge opportunity. Our traditional areas of strength, technology, services, and all that will continue to grow. Uh, of course, at a modest pace uh, of a, uh, maybe single digit, maybe high single digit uh, in some period, but otherwise 6, 7, 8% growth, but it will, on a large base, will uh, continue to grow. So there is some meaningful space for that too. Therefore, if you look around, there are multiple areas where opportunities are lying. On the other end, one of the most important things, when reforms are deep, they are many, and uh, they are synergistically combined together, then growth in one sector leads to the growth in other. And the second sector grows, therefore it brings growth in the third sector and therefore whole chain expands. It, uh, it results in symbiotic rise in expansion of the overall economy. That is the phenomenal sweet spot Indian leadership and planners seem to have struck upon where multiple areas are one after growing. If the roads are growing, demand for uh, demand for cement will grow. Uh, uh, you know, demand for cement grows, demand for energy and logistics and distribution will grow. Uh, 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 demand for energy itself mm, is a huge, huge opportunity because uh, we are the fastest growing energy consumers in the world today. And uh, energy transition and greening of the energy is again a huge area of opportunity. Therefore, energy financing, energy equipment, uh, whether it is made by bale or ABB or Siemens um, or, uh, you know, smart meters kind of opportunity uh, where uh, players are involved in greening of the energy. Uh, uh, many, many players, uh, Adani Group and others, so huge opportunity in many of these areas are combining together. Therefore, growth is synergistic. It is not one-off. It is well combining. It is syncretic together and synchronized rather than it is standalone. And therefore, the growth is not in silos. It is in synergy with each other. And therefore, uh, growth becomes faster, durable, and more predictable. On the lending side, uh, 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 the observation is right. While uh, balance sheets of the lenders have become better, moreover, balance sheets have become bigger. Uh, uh, 
uh, quality of the asset book of the lenders is uh, one of the best ever. The cost of capital is declined. These are fantastic opportunities for the finance and lending businesses to do well. But counted intuitively for the last two, three years, you know, the best of the finance and lending businesses have struggled to create value in sync with the underlying character of that growth. So it is a bit of an oddity. Uh, but I would I would say uh, the valuations are finally beginning to catch up on many of these businesses. And many of these businesses, which are top quality, are actually available at very reasonable price. And in markets, uh, ultimately, things are always level. Voter has to find level. Vote brings about, uh, vote may be catalyst. We all can try to predict. It may or may not happen with the kind of prediction of the catalyst we may. But invariably, if the valuations are attractive, business is sound, quality is right, and it grows, uh, uh, at some stage, suddenly, um, uh, revolution occurs and the prices begin to rise as if there is no tomorrow. So I think some more patience may be called for. But one last point I'll make on a longer term, many of the lending businesses are uh, more like me to kind of businesses. They, their capital efficiency is limited. Their ROAs are limited, return on asset. Many of them may have done to differentiate its skills in lending. Um, not all of them are great adapters of technology. Many of them are reluctant followers of the technology in the, uh, in the lending activity. Therefore, I would say players like Bajaj Finance and some others are special. Their ROIs are among the highest uh, consistently. ROEs are high. Asset quality is one of the best ever. And therefore, and their growth rates remain as distinguished as ever compared to all others. And valuations in many cases of players like Bajaj Finance have now begin, begin to look like or lower than um, businesses which are growing at half the rate and having half the capital efficiency. So I think um, in markets, justice always prevails. Uh, whether in other spheres of life it prevails or not. Eventually, valuations, uh, when they are in favor of a good business, they have to rise. At times, they test the patience, but I don't think beyond that there is any worry. But many commodity lenders, which do not have strength and uh, distinguished character, over a period of time, those commodity kind of lending businesses, I suspect, will mimic and look more like commodities where they become indistinguished. Those businesses, I think, uh, their uh, heydays are behind them. Thank you, Bharat, for the elaborate answer. I'm going to take questions of three uh, customers who put there. Mr. Bipul Shah, uh, who is an EOP investor, uh, EOF investor. Mr. Satish Rao, who is an India Select investor and Prasanna Simha, who is an IEP investor. And they have said that economy is very good, valuations are not high, our selected companies, Alpha is very good. We resonate with your thoughts. And I'm just expressing what they have said here. Uh, where are we doing some mistakes in our portfolio? Uh, when can we see turnaround? Uh, because it's been about three years for them. Uh, individually, as I said, somebody is in ISP, somebody is in IEP, somebody is in EOP. They all believe that all our portfolios are extremely high quality. We believe in what you say. Are we doing some mistakes? Uh, when can things, uh, according to you, start to uh, uh, deliver out performance or benchmark? Whether we made mistakes, uh, uh, answer is yes. Uh, whether we are making mistakes, uh, that is speculative because if we are making and we are realizing that we obviously need to correct unless we suffer from foolish ego where we recognize a mistake and yet we don't make any change. So that is a mood question, whether we are making mistakes or not. But whether we have made any mistakes, clearly we have. And I, without any hesitation, I can say uh, that, uh, uh, that we could have done uh, some of the things better, faster, 
uh, earlier uh, in more appropriate way. But if you really see in three years that you referred to Nimesh, it is 2022 where we have suffered. Really speaking, if I'm going by calendar year by calendar year, 2022 we suffered. Index was positive, but our portfolios were in a negative territory, both in single digit. Uh, index was single, low single digit positive. Uh, we were high single digit negative, and therefore that definitely was a year when we suffered. 2023, our portfolios in general have bounced back. Uh, they have produced an alpha over, uh, say, indices like Nifty or Sensex or even uh, BAC 100 kind of indices. But they have lesser alpha or negative alpha uh, compared to, say, wider indices like uh, mid-cap index or small-cap index, which have done very well in this particular period. So uh, 2023 absolute performance has been healthy. Uh, strategies have delivered anywhere ranging from uh, 25 to all the way to 42% kind of numbers depending upon different strategies in different composition in the year of 23. Uh, all of them uh, ahead of uh, narrow indices like Nifty or Sensex uh, in sync with uh, uh, kind of index like 100, but uh, lower than the uh, larger indices. 2024, again, a picture is similar, where so far uh, the portfolios are ahead of narrow indices like Nifty and Sensex, but uh, behind uh, wider indices like mid-cap and small-cap indices. Now, <clears throat> Therefore, uh, 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 the, what are the kind of mistakes we made in 2022, in my opinion? 2022, I think our uh, portfolio suffered from A, uh, uh, being behind in judging PSE opportunity, which went up in a huge way. And we took our own time to come to the conclusion about value and opportunity in PSEs. Secondly, even among the non-PSU businesses, there were some very attractive ones. Uh, we have been slow in embracing them or in recognizing them. And uh, therefore, there were some errors of omission in 2022, material number of errors of omission of out of that basket. Many of them may not be highest quality, but uh, quite a few of them are good enough quality, very decent quality businesses, which we should have embraced and we should have, and we were behind. Thirdly, uh, this is a period where mid-sized businesses and small-sized businesses have done extremely well. Not always meritoriously, uh, but some of them definitely deserve and meritoriously they have reason. So it is not as if uh, rise of the mid-cap businesses, all of them is unwarranted or similarly for small-cap. Many of the uh, mid-cap, mid-sized businesses, small-sized businesses fundamentally have improved in character, capability, strain, growth rate, durability, predictability, and all of that. And therefore, uh, they've done well. But larger indices of mid-size and small-sized businesses have done uh, remarkably well compared to narrow indices. So that gap is where we are still hurting. Uh, we are ahead on the wider indices, but we are uh, sorry uh, ahead of the narrower indices like Nifty and Sensex, but we are uh, still behind wider indices like mid-cap and small-cap indices. Uh, personally, we all can opine, and especially if our numbers are behind those indices, it may be very tempting for me to run down that these indices are wrong and there, therefore there is a problem, but I'll not do any of those. In my opinion, those indices have good reasons to have gone up. Whether they should have gone up as much as they have gone up is a moot question. That's, that is a much more interesting philosophical question to discuss, but... Per se, I do not think uh, that the rise of mid-size businesses or small-size businesses or indices per se is a false one or misplaced one in entirety. Uh, there are pockets where they fully deserve, 
there are uh, pockets where there is an artificial knitting or maybe short termism. So uh, we are watching the space. We are, uh, you see, uh, when uh, when you have not jumped into some of them, and then you are you are trying to move into them at a at a little later stage. There is always a fear that are we jumping in at a time when we are actually making a mistake, and therefore there will be a double whammy. Not only uh, we didn't get an advantage of them when they moved up, but we may get a disadvantage of them uh, by the time we get in. That concern worry always remains, and therefore there has been a little more watchful, I would say, cautious adoption of uh, some of the names in uh, this space. But it is improved. I would say 2022, we made many errors of omission. 2023, I think we still made some errors of omission, but much less. 2024, I think we are at par. Uh, and uh, we are in the right game. I think conditions are conducive, portfolios are right, valuations are in favor, uh, and our portfolios have the best growth rate in the market, well ahead of the indices, well ahead of virtually all portfolios around. In terms of the character of the growth, return on capital employed, return on equity, balance sheet strain, again, our portfolios, I would easily say, are unmatched in the marketplace. In sheer quality, they are unmatched. Therefore, Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, uh, the game of patience. Um, uh, markets may tend to make a false move. Uh, uh, therefore, there is always a worry that are we getting into a false move, or are we in, are we getting uh, are we missing out? So we are going through that kashmakash. We are going through that asamanjas uh, kind of a phase. Uh, uh, not that we are concerned or worried, but we are going about it a little more cautious. That's about it is, uh, uh, is what I uh, uh, I would say. But uh, beyond that, I think um, the portfolios on an absolute basis in these three years, barring 2022, have done resoundingly well. But such is the life when... Uh, when markets and some of the other uh, portfolios run up uh, at 30 and 40 percent, uh, then you are you look inferior. Uh, we are suffering from that inferiority right now without suffering inferiority in the mind. And hopefully, we are not suffering there. Uh, so therefore, portfolios, I can assert you, are robust, well-balanced, uh, good risk control, uh, among the best growth rates of earnings in the uh, in the market compared to other portfolios, compared to indices, in terms of the quality, character, return on capital employed, return on equity, uh, balance sheet strength, these are unmatched kind of portfolios, is very strongly, easily, I can assert. So that's where we are. But uh, ultimately, markets are... Uh, great enabler and fair place. And therefore, if he suffered in 2022, I, in my opinion, we deserved. Uh, we deserve to suffer in that year. Uh, if things are improving, maybe little sl at a slower pace than somebody may wish, uh, that is entirely valid criticism. But in my opinion, I think we are there. So thank you, brother, for so uh, answering the, the difficult question candidly. I just want to bring some data what Dwaj Bhai shared. In Q1 FI25, most of our portfolios are delivered closer to 20% kind of a pat, uh, whereas the broader index with BSE Finder is about 11%. The sales growth has been almost double of what the uh, BSE Finder is, as well as EBITDA has been significantly ahead of. Uh, and what he was talking is that in FI24 to 26, which is the next three years, uh, we uh, expect that our portfolio should deliver upwards of between 20 to 25% kind of uh, earnings growth. Uh, and the, for the index, it would be roughly half of it. Uh, if this, uh, what we believe, 
continues like what we say, uh, saw in Q1 With FI. Capital pretty efficiency much. more than two times uh, that of the market. I, I was just going to come that. Uh, average uh, capital efficiency in our portfolios would be upwards of 30%. It, it goes much higher, but I would say close to much 30%. Higher. Yeah, 35, 37%. In fact, IEP portfolio, which most of you own, is about 42%. The Lighthouse portfolio is upwards of 48, 49%. But I'm saying in the range of 35%, 36%. The index uh, would be, I would say about ballpark, 15, 17%, around that range. So you can see two and a half times capital efficiency, most of our businesses there. Earnings would be uh, upwards of again two, two and a half times. Uh, we believe that uh, our portfolios are very strong, resilient. And I'm talking of the, all the portfolios are not referring to one or another because there's question on ISP, there's question on growth, there's question on EOP and IP, rightly so. We believe, uh, I think the price uh, should uh, show up, uh, if not early, but in, in throughout the year, because fundamentally our businesses are very resilient and strong. In fact, I believe that, uh, I, I'm not being biased, I'm an investor myself, uh, these are times when one should really consider uh, adding some money uh, uh, given the strength of the portfolio has been there. You may shall uh, add one more point. Sure, that is more philosophical. When markets uh, in general seemingly do well, uh, we lose the sight of capital preservation uh, is an important objective. The value of it is an important objective because capital appreciation occupies all the attention and capital preservation loses in seemingly relevance in eyes of most of the people. But I would say it's a fatal error to make because ultimately capital preservation is the first principle of any investing exercise not just in uh, upward rising markets, but also in downward falling market. In all the phases, at every point of time, first principle of good investing is capital preservation. That you do not want to lose capital at any point of time, because it is much harder to get back to where you were if you lose capital on a permanent basis. Typically, the fear and the risk of capital preservation being damaged comes when you flirt with the quality. Either the quality of the business, quality of the management, quality of the balance sheet. When you flirt with them and you start taking chances. And in many phases of the market, bad businesses do much, much better. Bad managements also seemingly uh, uh, turn into gold, like Paras money. Uh, if you see the returns they create in a certain period, because uh, there is that human desire to make unjust uh, returns out of something which is undeserving. And it culminates into those kind of phases where bad businesses generate disproportionate return and bad management generate disproportionate return. But all of that um, can, can never last. Eventually, when you take a meaningfully higher risk than you should, uh, invariably the penalty is to be paid in not only in terms of reduced return, but maybe negative returns. And there, and there are no easy ways to regress out of markets at that time. Uh, you can't really say that, okay, while going is good, I'll uh, gain benefit. And when going gets difficult, I'll be able to quickly turn around and get out of it. It doesn't happen that way in investing. Therefore, I would say we should never lose sight of capital preservation. Quality is very important, whether markets regard it as fashionable or otherwise at a point of time. Uh, solidity of business is vital. Character of the management is vital. Otherwise, bad managements can destroy businesses aground without even knowing. There are Examples galore, not in India, but all over the world, where bad managements, how they destroy the businesses. Also, misplaced valuations when you buy into, also is a recipe for a lot of mediocrity of returns or troubles. And therefore, we are very, very careful that neither we want to overtake, nor we want to flirt and compromise on quality. 
and at the same time we want to ensure that our business is a very strong growth our business is compared to the uh, i mean out of the three key parameters which determine returns and the value creation quality growth and the uh, uh, valuation our quality uh, our portfolios are top notch uh um, in terms of the growth rate our portfolios are top notch in terms of the valuation arithmetically speaking our portfolios may be at a uh, at a middling level but maybe at a high middling more on the upper bend rather than in the lower bend so our portfolios will look more expensive uh in the uh, uh in nominal p terms but if you blend all the three uh, which is what is important for capital preservation and growth uh, we think our portfolios are very well poised and uh, i must also repeat ultimately capital preservation only is the way capital appreciation comes when you lose sight of capital preservation that means you take risks that you should not be taking uh, then invariably not only capital appreciation doesn't happen but capital preservation is impaired i would make a similar comment on absolute returns ultimately dharma is investor whether for my own money or that of the clients is to generate absolute returns over a period of time over a period of time we must compound wealth we must make it grow without taking chances that we think are unreasonable um uh, in a solid relentless way capital must grow it must compound and compound and compound that basically is absolute investing that I, you don't quarrel with mr market you don't fight with mr market you don't get into fist fist um, uh, fist fight with the mr market you bow before mr market you do what you have to do and you ensure that you grow and grow and grow we strongly believe in that at the same time i must also make a point that absolute returns also with it brings relatively superior returns over a period of time sometimes in a particular period it may not happen that for a year or two or three but uh, invariably uh, both are very deeply correlated absolute gets relative as well preservation gets uh, appreciation as well i thought philosophically it was vital to bring that point uh, 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 so just wanted to add that comment so very valuable uh, and i've read your book and seen markets i think uh, what is you said is uh, pearls of wisdom thank you for sharing that with us uh, mr radhakrishna menon uh, mr vinit kumar uh, you have raised your hand but uh, in this kind of a zoom we will have to type the question we will not be able to unmute yourself so please type it But the next question I'm combining again for a few people. Mr. Amrit Singh has asked uh, uh, about lighthouse portfolio uh, at the current levels. He believes expensive. And Mr. Abhin Bhagwani uh, ans asked the question to your two uh, answers before. He's saying, "How are you finding infra at reasonable valuations?" And this guy is asking similarly that you know lighthouse you have infra just stocks. so how are you finding them uh, comfortable at this point in time is what they were no, finding in my opinion those businesses are not expensive at all in lighthouse art valuation numbers are actually somewhat lower than our main board full board portfolios like indian entrepreneurial portfolio or emerging opportunity portfolio growth or india select portfolios uh, those main board portfolios in nominal pe terms are more expensive than lighthouse we we have made no compromise on qualitative terms in lighthouse rocs are robust roes are robust growth rates are even higher uh, growth rates are even higher uh, than the uh, uh, our other main board portfolios so i i don't know uh, why that impression uh, has been about uh, the portfolio is expensive actually uh, it is not um, only difference in lighthouse is it is very strongly focused on those areas including infrastructure and manufacturing in very high proportion 
where we see a distinguished growth rate well ahead of the GDP, well ahead of the markets. Uh, and uh, these lighthouse portfolios is um, a kind of a subset of our main board portfolios where it is only focused on these businesses uh, because infrastructure businesses are indeed growing at a rapid pace. Energy, energy transition, aviation business, ports business, uh, uh, roads and related services business, capital goods business, defense, railways, Many of these uh, manufacturing businesses, all of them uh, are on move. Uh, some indeed, uh, in some individual businesses, of course, would have uh, what may look like a higher valuation. But as I said, uh, you, know, you always have to view the Troika, quality, growth and valuation together, along with the uh, prevalence of that over a longer period. In other words, durability, predictability, solidity, resilience of that growth. So when we take into account that, uh, these portfolios are beautifully poised uh, for uh, that. And I would in fact say that these are not overvalued at all. They are much more concentrated. They are into limited relative areas. So the lighthouse portfolio doesn't have, say, consumer needs. It doesn't have pharmaceutical. So it doesn't have lending business. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't have any, uh, uh, say, software business, you know. Uh, therefore, it is uh, businesses where we see, not in short term only, but over medium to long term, say, uh, uh, five years and more, we see meaningfully elevated growth compared to market, compared to GDP, uh, compared to virtually most of the businesses in indices. And therefore, that's where this portfolio is focused. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, this has to complement our main board portfolios. It is not uh, to be viewed merely independently as isolated portfolio in itself. It has to be viewed as a complement and as a part of our portfolio, where along with our main board portfolio, maybe some amount of capital is allocated to the lighthouse portfolio. But we made, I must repeat, we made no compromise on quality and character of the businesses. Selection of themes may be top down. Uh, the trend or the idea or where we think opportunities are lying. But selection of the names are purely bottom up. And therefore, balance sheets are healthy, uh, ROCs are healthy, ROEs are healthy, growth rates are available. And uh, in context of all of that, these businesses are not unduly priced at all. Uh, so, I uh, again, fantastic uh, request. You know, you can use in combinations. So you can take IP and Lighthouse. You can take Growth and Lighthouse. That would be the ideal thing. Individually, also, it's a, uh, you know, uh, excellent portfolio. The P would be still in the range of about 30 to 23 times, which is what Balba is saying is uh, not expensive, given that in ROC in that portfolio is as close to 50%. And the growth is significantly ahead. But we request you to consider as a combination with your core portfolio, which is IP and uh, Lighthouse. But I would just share, Naresh Kumar ji has shared the previous answer. Excellent description, sir, to your... Uh, you infuse confidence immensely. Our PMS is surely in safe hands. That's what Mr. Naresh Kumar is. Very, very kind of you to say. Gratified to hear that. Uh, Mr. Vinay Tyagi uh, has uh, is a question you asked many times, but uh, I have to put forward to you. Uh, you know, Bajaj Finance hasn't delivered uh, for the last two, two and a half years. Now we've been holding. Uh, I think you he mentioned that AU Bank also have been holding for quite some time. So bank and AU Bank and Bajaj Finance, what's your view? Uh, so we're moving to the third segment. We're going stock by. So over to you, Bharat Bhai, for that. Uh, I, would, I would say AU Bank uh, compared to Bajaj Finance is a very different business. Not as uh, clearly, neither in terms of size, capital efficiency, growth rate. AU Bank will match up to Bajaj Finance, uh, neither today nor tomorrow. And therefore, both have a different reasons for being part of portfolio. Both have different strengths. Bajaj Finance, I, I would say that I already mentioned return on asset, highest in the industry, return on equity, highest in the industry, 
easily one of the best governed businesses, growth rate easily the highest in the industry, and all that with a very conservative balance sheet. Where leveraging in Bajaj Finance over 15 years has never exceeded five times the network. Moment leveraging touches or about to touch five times, they invariably raise equity and ensure that the debt equity ratios are brought below five to one. Therefore, it easily runs the most conservative balance sheet in the lending activity in the country. In my opinion, probably one of the best run global finance franchises uh, anywhere you can find of this quality and resoluteness. In terms of technology and capability to learn new things, Bajaj Finance invariably is ahead of the curve. They have invested in technology, not today, but 10 years and 12 years back is a good percentage of their income, net interest income into technology. Every year they visit uh, Silicon Valley for a week just to learn new technologies and new ideas which may come by. So it's a very, very progressive, very futuristic, prepared organization. Valuation-wise, for exactly the same reason that you articulated, that price has gone up at a lesser pace than the underlying business performance, and therefore price is uh, the the relatively less returns it has delivered in these uh, two and a half years has meant stock has become underpriced. And look at the irony. Bajaj Housing Finance, which was a subsidiary of Bajaj Finance, it still is a subsidiary. Earlier it was 100% subsidiary. Now it is 84% subsidiary of Bajaj uh, Finance. It is valued even higher than Bajaj Finance itself. Uh, this is an ultimate irony of the source. So I think um, uh, this is an interesting phase. My humble request to you is uh, mm, uh, be a little more patient. It's a great business. It's a great franchise. And whenever uh, tables turn, and, uh, more often than not in the market, it does full justice and not only partial justice. So I would, I would say... Uh, you know, exactly at a moment when it may look like one is uh, exhausted and waiting with patience is exactly the time when patience is most importantly required. And as I mentioned, we should never, never forget capital preservation is a primary objective. Being in a high quality, high growth, top-notch governed business at a reasonable valuation and to get exhausted by that uh, will be a sign of our weakness rather than that of the business. Uh, thanks. Maybe we, uh, about five, seven minutes last, I'm just taking uh, two or three questions which is combined together again. Sunish Anandji has asked that, uh, do you hold portfolio in cash and should you be holding? Another person, Mr. Adarsh, has asked that, um, yeah, uh, should we sell off uh, a mid-cap portfolio and uh, again, move into cash. So I think the question is, uh, they believe that uh, are the markets at a high and therefore will ASK uh, portfolio have, uh, has cash in the portfolio and whether they should convert into cash uh, at this point? I'll answer it at three levels, philosophy, practical, and personal. At a philosophical level, um, we will never hold cash. Uh, it is very, very unlikely. In 23 years in running this uh, largest PMS business in the country, we have done it only once. And while it went in our favor to hold that cash, uh, I still regret that decision because philosophically it was not a pure decision to make. And therefore, even though it benefited us and the clients, I still feel... Philosophically, it was a mistake to me uh, to do such a thing. Uh, because ultimately, you have uh, given money to us uh, to invest into the businesses and not to hold cash. Because that cash, you can hold yourself rather than we hold uh, on your behalf and charge you fees for that. Therefore, 
money that you have given to us is for investment and that is what our dharma our duty is to uh, put it to the best uh, opportunities available and if we if we generally find that markets are not only overvalued but across the board overvalued and when everything looks not only overvalued but grotesquely overvalued only in that condition uh, um, uh, there is a sense of holding any cash. I see, my personal opinion is uh, uh, that I see no such situation. I don't see such a grotesque overvaluation at all, at a market level, at uh, indices level. Uh, at individual stocks, there can be aberrations, but that's for us to pick and choose and ensure to be be into those businesses which are still reasonably, relatively speaking, uh, price. So uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, when there are no uh, unhealthy market conditions, uh, uh, market health in many other ways is very sound. Uh, individual investors are rising percentage of the market. Therefore, there is a counterpoint in the market. It is no longer foreign investor dominated market, which had held only one view. And based on their own pleasure or pain, markets in India used to suffer in the past or gain unduly. Both were unreasonable uh, things to happen. Now, today, we have a very strong domestic institutional element, very strong domestic retail element, and domestic high net worth element. All of these um, provide a counterpoint to foreign money and that makes markets healthy and less volatile. Also, in terms of diversity of the businesses, I think there is no market like India. It is across the board so many sectors, so many choices of the businesses to make and that systemically large number of choices reduces risk on the market. I'll give you one example. In America, if you remove seven, eight top names like Microsoft, Apple, NVIDIA, uh, Google, Meta, etc., those seven, eight fabulous ones, then even Dow Jones has not made any money over a 10-year period. Therefore, even the largest market, largest economy is so dependent on a handful of businesses to guide your destiny. That's a risky thing, uh, actually. Well, India has diverse choices across so many sectors that I narrated earlier. Therefore, market conditions are healthy, choices are diverse, uh, money flows are in balance. You've seen how foreigners have sold over the last two, two and a half years, and yet markets have not caved in. In any other condition previously, markets would have lost 50% in such conditions. And uh, here you are, markets have risen and have actually grown in that period in sync with the earnings and the character of growth. So I think overall conditions are healthy. Valuations in general uh, for uh, businesses are reasonable. I'll not say they are cheap, but I'll certainly say they are not expensive either. So that's a very healthy market. Uh, I see no reason in a healthy market like this for... Uh, 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 for we to hold money or cash on your behalf because we are not uh, we uh, we don't have a mandate from you to hold cash on your behalf because you have decided to give us money to compound. Finally at a personal level I'll say personally every bit of more money that I get uh, goes into equities. Uh, uh, I keep putting more money into my company's uh, portfolios only. In uh, strategies, I keep on pumping money. Wherever, uh, whatever we additionally we can buy, permitted to buy, my money goes into equities. It has no place anything else. And I um, regard every uh, diminution or drop in the market as a long-term opportunity rather than a short-term worry. Uh, that is the situation of the market, in my opinion, we are in. Our economy is for the long run. Our um, societal uh, strength is in a long-term ascendance. Uh, our markets are in that long-term strength. Uh, and so are the underlying businesses. And therefore, 
our investments are in the long term asset guns uh, trying to get to concerned that every twist and turn will be counterproductive actually and finally there is no magic formula to decide which point when one should pull in the plug and uh, vacate the market and precisely figure out which point one should get back. Uh, theoretically or in uh, practice, uh, neither way, uh, world has not yet found a method to do it successfully time after time. So these are, uh, I would very politely urge you, I will humbly request uh, not to get carried away by by television noise and not to get carried away by newspaper noise. Uh, both uh, all sorts of media is nothing but noise by and large, barring some very few sensible voice. And don't get carried away by what you hear in party uh, from the people, uh, those who have made money or those who have lost money either way. Um, I think as a country, we are in a tremendous phase and you get this kind of a phase once in a lifetime. Don't uh, sacrifice it by unnecessarily trying to get concerned. I think, Bharata, you summed up uh, the question and the uh, webinar also for today. And Mr. Vinay Tagi has just, I think, given the perfect uh, thank you for such a detailed response, uh, Bharat Bhai, is what he ended there. And I also thank on behalf of all the investors and partners who joined us today for being uh, so candid uh, in your con uh, conversations. Uh, we look forward to host Investors, uh, as you all know, the fund managers of individual portfolios will talk to each one of you post November 15 when the results of this quarter will get over. I request you all to join and know more about uh, each stock sector changes, uh, updates on the portfolio post November 15. We we'll reach out to all of you, and the uh, recording of this portfolio, uh, this webinar, will be sent to you over an email. Um, if there are any further questions, uh, please write to us. We'll be happy to answer that. Thank you, Bharat, once again. For your time. Thank you, and thank uh, I thank everybody on the on the call uh, for their questions, uh, for their uh, uh, inputs and the feedback, and deeply respect, deeply appreciate. But I think we are on a phenomenal long term value creation, wealth creation journey. For me, wealth is uh, means to an end, not an end in itself. And I think we are at a cusp of that phenomenal opportunity as a country, as market, as people, as investors, as custodian of the money, uh, uh, whether your money or my money, I remain a trustee of both. And um, we will do our damnedest best to ensure that we give a good account of it. And I believe uh, that we'll continue to deliver on the cusp of the defining opportunity for long time. Mr. Nitin Manek and Ranjan Ji has said that thanks Bharat Bhai for insight and updates. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.